So our participants are arriving. Um, and I want to start by welcoming everyone to our 25th public colloquium at Kadiras University. And there are now online public colloquiums. And we are very happy and honored to be welcoming our guest today, Professor Nargis Mavalvala from NYT. And without further ado, I would like to leave the ground to our Vice President and Dean of uh, Faculty of Engineering and Natural Sciences, Professor Niat Berkay. Uh, hello, uh, thank you, Yeshim. Uh, thank you, Nergis. Uh, it's a very uh, special day for me today. Uh, and as usual, let me start uh, by duly thanking our President, Sondan Durukan Olufeyiz, for supporting this a series of colloquia which I think have been very good for our school and for the country, as we can see from the attendance. Thank you for your everlasting support, dear president. Now, today is very special for me uh, because I have a longtime friend, longtime friend of many years ago, uh, Nergis Mavalvala, whom I think I know quite well, who has also visited us in person in Istanbul. Uh, a person, uh, I think, a uh, great scientist, a great educator, a great administrator, all of these truly great, but also a, a very modest, a very kind, a very nice person, but at the same time, also a tough person, uh, someone who, who has uh, uh, courage, uh, but at the same time is a very nice person. Uh, so uh, he has been, she has been a role model for me, and more than a role model, someone who has enlightened my life and my way of looking at life. So Nergis, thank you for being yourself, and thank you for being here. And without further ado, myself, I leave the world to our president, Sondan Rukhan Olfeyiz. Okay. Uh, Nihat Ojam, as always, first thanks goes to you, and I'm really, really thankful to you for organizing this exceptional series of colloquiums and dear attendees is my great great pleasure to introduce today's speakers professor Nagis Mavalvala. She's an exceptional scientist, exceptional person, exceptional humanist but let me give a brief information about the milestones in her academic life and then I will leave the floor to my our dear friend Nagis. Uh, Nagis, she got her uh, bachelor degrees in 1990 in, in physics and astronomy at Wesley College. And this was goes to the undergraduate student, the current undergraduate students. She had in a paper in the physical review as an undergraduate student, which is top, among the top journals in condensed matter physics. That shows how science, how, uh, that, show, uh, that was uh, actually a proof for her to be a real scientist. And now she's gonna talk us as a scientist. And then she, uh, she, she become part of the uh, MIT in 1997. She got her PhD in physics at MIT. Between year 1997 and 2000, she was a postdoctoral researcher and a research scientist at Caltech. And then she, she became part of this huge group, LIGO, uh, who got the Nobel Prize uh, for detecting the gravitational waves in the fabric of space time. And in year 2002, she joined MIT faculty and now she is the Dean of uh, School of Science at MIT. And in year 2017, she was elected to the National Academy of Science in USA. Now, uh, I don't wanna be the one uh, between Nagis and the people here in this uh, conference. Uh, Nagis, the microphone is yours and thanks again for becoming the part of this Colloquium series. <laughs> so, so thank you very, very much, Sasandan and, and Nihad. A very generous intro introduction. Um, I will just tell again if there are uh, there are un undergraduates and graduate students in uh, in the audience. Um, you know, um, 
I actually learned quantum mechanics from Professor Berker. So if you ever have a chance to take a class with him, uh, do not pass up on it. You, you, will, you will learn a lot. You will work like hell, but you will learn a lot and, uh, and, and, and it will be very enjoyable. So thank you for, for having me here. I'm going to uh, share my screen in, 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 in uh, just a minute. Uh, but before I do, I also just wanted to, to sort of, of say, you know, uh, my own uh, story is, has been that I, I've been a, a researcher. I'm an experimentalist. I love building uh, things in the lab. And then uh, 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 maybe about five or six years ago, I also got much more heavily involved in university administration. And, in, in, and, and for the past many years, uh, <clears throat> as the associate head of the physics department, in which role I got to re work I had a primary responsibility for the education programs of the department. And my talk today, which is, uh, which is uh, titled, um, you know, Education and Social Equity in Pandemic Times, uh, uh, reflects some of the work we did in the department. So that's sort of the background that I'm gonna, gonna set up for you. So let me uh, just take half a minute and set up my, uh, my screen share, and then uh, we will launch into the topic for, um, uh, for today. Also, give me a, a second here to Do you all see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, very good. Uh, so a few important things uh, um, I, that I wanted to uh, say uh, even as I begin. Um, so the first thing is I'm really going to, I'm going to try to focus on, on the social equity part of the educational mission in, in this talk. Uh, I'm going to apologize before, you know, upfront that this is a, a, a somewhat, uh, except towards the end when I'll be more general, this is a somewhat, uh, uh, it's focused on some of the experiments that we have done in uh, within MIT and within the physics department. That's what my, my, my experience has been. And I also want to acknowledge very much upfront uh, uh, the, um, that I got a lot of help from uh, professors Ed Bershinger and Sherston Perez of the physics department at MIT in preparing at least one important part of this, this presentation because it's based on their, on their work. So I'm using some of their slides, et cetera. So uh, without further uh, ado, let's uh, think a little bit about the question of equity and what does equity mean in higher education? So the very first thing that one, one would, uh, has to think about, and again, in the context of the you know, educa higher education in the, in the United States, uh, the biggest questions are uh, to, to do with access to educational institutions. And that means, you know, who can go to college or university? What are the life circumstances of individuals that even lead up to the point where you can contemplate going to uh, uh, university? Uh, I'll say another thing. I'm going to use college and university quite interchangeably uh, in my in my presentation. Um, the the second question one can ask is who has access to education, and that's a really important distinction. Access to educational institutions is who actually can go to university. Access to education is who will succeed in 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 university, and there are very many different measures of. Uh, of, of, of success, uh, you know, everything from who will complete their degrees, who will, who will get good grades, you know, uh, how much time does it take for a student to get to, uh, to, to graduation. Another big issue in equity is the cost of education, which is who can afford to go to, to university. And certainly in, 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 in the US, uh, there is a very wide range of costs, you know, with the, with the very uh, elite, you know, Top tier research universities can cost you know seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, all the way down to community colleges, which still cost many thousands of dollars a year. And so there's the cost of higher education, and then there's, I think, one of the most you know difficult and important issues to address in within higher education and equity, and that is what are the cultures and subcultures within educational institution, institutions. And these come to issues of race, of gender, of class, of disabilities, of you know, what are the dominant cultures? You know, what, you know, what are what are the toxic parts of dominant culture? You know, when you have a you know, have a, a football school, what does that mean? When, when you have a party school, what does that mean? When you have a, a very serious academic institution, 
even there you have you know uh, subcultures that can be very uh, very uh, uh, distinctive so i think it's very very important to understand these things now before i jump into you know, really looking at a couple of case studies and that's what i'm going to do today i want to actually step back a little and make sure we understand the terms and terminology uh, that I'm going to use. So there are three terminologies that I want to distinguish between, uh, and there's as equity, there's equality, and there's justice, and they are not the same. So the first thing we can look at is the, there's the question of equality. So here are three people of different heights who are trying to view a, a soccer game over a fence. Equality is when you give each of them an equal uh, uh, amount of resources. So, and you can see that doesn't really work very well because clearly the shortest person here doesn't uh, gain the advantages that the taller people do from having equality. Equity, which is what we're talking about, is, the, is this uh, picture on the left. And that is saying you give additional resources, in this case, multiple uh, you know, height in enhancers to the shortest person, to the people who need it most, so that in the end, the outcome is that everybody has, has equal access to whatever they're trying to achieve, in this case, viewing the soccer game over the fence. And then finally, justice is yet another step further, which is saying, reduce the barrier so that you don't even need to, to add additional resources. Uh, everybody can have access to uh, you know, this, shared, this shared event of the soccer game. So I wanna make that distinction and I'm gonna be talking about equity. It's not the same as equality. Equity is not be, being equal. Equity is about what is fair, okay? And so that's the, the distinction. Now there's another set of terms I want to define as as well, and that are that are used widely on you know in in the sphere of higher education, certainly in the United States right now, and that is um, is diversity, e equality, and and inclusion. So diversity refers to everyone is an individual and is different, and we must recognize these differences and 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 embrace them and not think of people as unworthy because they're not like ourselves. Equality is of equal access to, uh, to opportunities. And, and, and again, it, there's a distinction between equality and equity, but they're often used a bit, um, in, a, a bit loosely, uh, interchangeably. And then finally, I think very important and most important in terms of the work that lies ahead is inclusion. And inclusion is a sense of belonging where every individual feels respected and valued for, for who they are. And, and that has to, that comes about from creating a, a supportive energy and, and, a, and a community uh, in which you know, there's a commitment for every person to do the best work that they can in an organization. And you'll see this theme come up uh, uh, in, in, in my talk as well. So these are some general principles and this was already in the dialogue before the global pandemic hit. And so now I wanna take, take a couple minutes to just sort of step back and say, well, what happened with the pandemic? So what happened? Well, when the pandemic hit, uh, uh, several things happened almost instantaneously, truly overnight. Uh, college campuses had to be depopulated in the case of residential cam uh, campuses. And in, in, uh, this was, you know, especially hard because students had to literally pack up all their belongings and, and, and leave. Uh, shortly after that exodus of clearing out the campuses, which happened in, in mostly in, in, in March of 2020, there was this very abrupt shift from residential education where students lived in dorms and woke up in the morning and, and well, some woke up in the afternoon, but that's fine. And then they went to, to classes on campus suddenly they were living at home uh, or, or wherever else they could find a place to live that was not campus. And they would wake up in the morning or the afternoon or the night, and they would have to open up their computers and do their learning entirely online remotely. And the consequences of that were that all aspects of experiential education or hands-on education came to a, a, a stunning 
uh, halt. And so here, experiential education, uh, you know, uh, refers to combining sort of education with 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 uh, with the lived experience. So it could it could be uh, community focused work. It could be you know co cooperatives where students also work in 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 industry. Uh, hands-on education, lab classes, uh, you know, uh, uh, any kind of, of maker and building-based uh, based education um, all came to a, a sort of a sudden halt. Uh, and, then, and then sort of one of the other parts of residential education that really I think has been the most painful has been sort of the, the community, the group, the team-based learning also became much, much harder when people can't be together. So that was the setting. The, the, the global pandemic threw us into this setting uh, with, uh, within the, the, the universities uh, as it struck in, in last spring. Um, and the other thing that uh, it has done for, for us is it has really highlighted the, the opportunity divide. It's really sort of brought to the fore that higher education it has many, many inequities in it. And those became very uh, apparent uh, as we made this shift from residential to online education uh, in different ways than the things I talked about earlier, which were to, to do with, with you know, cost and access and ability. This is saying even the students who were accessing educational institutions, they were admitted to universities, even the students who were accessing education, they were learning suddenly it all became much harder. So what were the issues? So there was questions of technology and connectivity, like how do students actually, uh, uh, you know, find uh, computers, find Wi-Fi's and hotspots? How do they actually connect? What's the physical space that they occupy? They're living at home. Are they, you know, are they in, in families where they have their, their own bedroom and uh, or their own space to do work in or are they sharing the space with multiple siblings and family members there were time zones to 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 manage and then there were all the other issues that came with the pandemic there were emotional stress stressors that are you know, including questions of health and and and, and isolation uh, there were financial stressors you know families you know multiple families had had lost jobs uh, you know, and so including students who also many students on campuses work to support their education. So there were this whole host of issues that really uh, sort of widened the, the gap in opportunity. And in the midst of all of this, there was a very strong uh, um, observation that the focus must be on the most vulnerable students. And I'll give you one example. So this was a uh, this was a, 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 a tweet on March 10. So this is, you know, literally, if, at least at MIT, this is the almost the day after the students were all sent home, and uh, the whole campus is buzzing with, you know, getting going online to to get classes going, and 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 many schools, MIT being one of them, had had a pretty good track record of already having a number of large online classes. So the technologies were often in place. So. Here is Justin Reich. Justin Reich is a professor uh, in the Comparative Media Studies program at MIT and one of the world's experts on online education. Long before everybody went online for the pandemic, Justin has been studying this. And he points out that there is a growing body of evidence that suggests that online learning works least well for the most vulnerable learners. If you're going to go online, the number one question is not what tech, the number one question is, how will you support your most struggling students? So this was a real call to really support all learners, but especially focus on those who face complicated and difficult situations uh, they, you know, that are related to this, this string of, 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 of issues and stressors, but also many, many other things that I haven't mentioned. And so now I want to sort of go into sort of setting this backdrop. I want to go into a couple of case studies that will help us, that will help us uh, sort of understand, uh, you know, help us uh, see some of the things that worked out well for us at, 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 at MIT. Uh, and the examples I've taken are from the physics department indeed, because those are the things that I've myself worked on and I'm closest to. 
Uh, but I think some of these lessons can be widely uh, applicable. So the two things I'll talk about are a mentoring program that was uh, uh, that was launched uh, in response to the pandemic, and I'll tell you quite a bit about that. And then an undergraduate uh, uh, research uh, program. This is a part of MIT's existing Europe program or undergraduate research opportunities program, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about an, a, 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 a rapid expansion that had to, to be done. So uh, let's start with the, the mentoring. And for this part of my, my talk, I really uh, acknowledge uh, professors at Birchinger and, and, and Shirsten Perez from the physics department who have sort of led the mentoring uh, efforts uh, uh, in, in the physics department uh, through the, the pandemic. So um, before I go into sort of the, the, the details of the program, let me just uh, step back for, uh, for a moment and tell you uh, 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 you know, what are sort of the best practices uh, in uh, effective uh, mentorship. And the idea here is to, to this is uh, a, this is a, a, this is guidance that was, it was issued by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and, and Medicine um, in 2019. And there are three elements to it. There's uh, the green box, which is skill development. And that really is to the, to, to the, uh, you know, goes to the point of, uh, of developing, uh, educating uh, a, 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 an individual, a mentee, an education that includes sort of not just teaching them the, the, the nuts and bolts of, the, of, of whatever subject matter, but also understanding what the challenges they face, both academically and, and, and professionally. Uh, and then another thing that I, that that you know we should make a distinction on is tutoring is not the same as mentoring. Mentoring can include tutoring, but it is much wider than just tutoring a, a, a student into into mastering the subject material. And and the skill development side focuses on learning the subject material. Then there is this a second component, which is the, the psychological and emotional support. And here. Here, the mentors, the best practices that mentors encourage mentees, they help with problem solving and they use active listening techniques, which are techniques in, in which you, know, you, you invite mentees to speak of their, their, their experience rather than always just throwing information at them. And then the third part is of course, role modeling. And in this in, 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 you know, case, the mentor serves as a guide for the mentee's behaviors, their values, their attitudes. Uh, and the mentees sort of ha have this benefit uh, when they engage with a mentor who shares their, 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 their values and has similarities to, to them. And one of the ways in which this really um, it manifests itself is the importance, for example, of minority students having a mentor that may be of, from the same minority group. And then there is this sort of shared experience that, that really helps mentees envision themselves in, uh, you know, as future leaders and in the roles uh, that they see their mentors in, in, in the case of, of, of uh, in the academic setting, even as future academics. So that's the, 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 the framework of, of mentorship. Uh, a, a simpler uh, sort of, uh, 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 sort of uh, way to think about it is, is that, that the mentoring model that Ed sort of embraced and started for the MIT physics department was sort of a, like a co-pilot relationship, which means that there has to be uh, an implicit trust between between both pa parties and that both the mentor and mentee guide the relationship. This is not all about the mentee asking for help. And this is not all about the mentor, you know, uh, 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 sort of pushing and channeling the, the, the mentee to understand, you know, this is again, the co-pilot relation to understand that conditions will change, turbulence may occur and communicating is, is essential. And that that skill only improves with guidance and commitment. You can't learn new things just by wanting to learn new things. Neither the mentee nor the mentor can make that learning happen without the the, the commitment uh, to the effort. So that was the the, the model. Uh, so what was this mentoring program? The mentoring program was the, was carried out in a class uh, uh, 802, which is uh, 
electricity and magnetism. It's the second semester of first year physics at, at MIT. And one of the, the uh, uh, unique and some people would say odd features of MIT education for undergraduates is that all undergraduates must take one year of physics. So this is a class that can have enrollments of seven to 800 uh, students. Now, shortly after the first midterm exam, classes quickly moved online, and this was in March 2020. Ed Birchinger was one of the instructors in 802, and he was very concerned that struggling students would fall further behind. And, and you know, again, reminded by what Professor Justin Reich had, 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 had learned from his re research. And so Ed launched a mentorship program that matched students with a mentor. And the mentors were either undergraduate TAs, graduate TAs, or instructors, or faculty and instructors. And mentors and mentees met for roughly one hour uh, each uh, each week. Now I will add that the 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 student uh, the the Ed had wanted to do this mentoring program uh, and had been planning for it for a long time, but the COVID disruption really sort of catapulted this into uh, into into a higher level of need, and he really focused a lot of his attention and and resources uh, to launch this in a, in a very uh, a short time. So what were the, the goals for, for the, that spring program? The goals were to help students uh, who, who had not performed well after the first exam uh, to pass the class and to develop the skills they would need for the, the next later classes they would, uh, they would take. A second and important goal was to enhance the self-efficacy STEM and STEM identity of students. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more. So self-efficacy is one, the belief in one's own ability to do something. So there is research that shows that for certain types of STEM education in particular, and, and this happens at MIT as well, students enter a class having a certain amount of confidence in their abilities. And after a semester of taking their, that class, their confidence in their abilities actually declines. And so that is a loss of self-efficacy. So the idea was to increase self-efficacy uh, and to uh, uh, establish a STEM identity. Now, STEM identity really refers to how one sees one's own self with respect to science and engineering. This idea, oh, you know, so in physics, for example, there's this common uh, uh, a thread of, oh my goodness, I know I, I've never taken physics, I'm scared of physics, or I took physics in high school and I hated it, I had a terrible teacher, or I just am not good at it. So those are identities that individuals form about themselves in relation to the subject they're learning. So part of the mentoring program was to, to create this positive STEM identity. And then of course, to integrate the, the mentee's social and other identities into the context of MIT's cultural setting. So if a, if, a, if a student was strongly identified with a minority group, how do you, you work that into the, the coursework and the subject matter and the, the mentoring that they're receiving? And then a third goal was to, of course, to prom promote academic advancement. And really, in, in this case, this is through one-on-one one -on -one encouragement, through support, and through skill building. So this was a it is a, a course-based mentoring program, so it's, it's specific to students studying electricity and, and magnetism. So in this particular case, the, the skill building included problem solving, test taking, and sort of conceptual reasoning skills in, in, in physics. So those were sort of the three uh, important goals of the program. Uh, so how did the, the program go? So eventually uh, there were, there were uh, 23 uh, um, mentors uh, and 17 were undergraduate TAs, three were, were instructional staff and three were faculty mentors. And there were several other mentors were in reserve should, you know, for, should the need have arise. 110 mentees completed an online form to participate. So how that worked was the, there was an invitation made to all the students who had, who had done the, uh, um, uh, performed below 70% in their first exam, and that was pre-pandemic. And, and, uh, and that invitation brought in, I think, something like 80 students. And then there was a second invitation that was sent out to all students saying, anyone who wants to 
participate in our mentoring program, please apply. And that process brought in 110 uh, uh, um, mentees and eight, 88 of those mentees sort of uh, participated in at least three or, or, or more uh, mentoring sessions. And then on the right is, is a sort of a, 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 a a chart of what the program, what we learned from the program. So what you see is you have uh, four student groups. The most important one to to uh, to look at is is group uh, is the is group um, uh, one, which was a group that did poorly on the first exam and went through mentoring. And the second group to look at is 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 group two that also did poorly on the first exam, but declined to have mentoring. And then the three and four are the converse. A group three is a group that did well on the first exam, but uh, entered the mentoring program. And then of course, a vast majority, over 500 students that uh, did well on the first exam and didn't uh, uh, enter the mentoring program. And then the, 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 there's a few interesting things to, to look at. Uh, for what the gains were for the group. So group one is, is the is the the group that did uh, did the you know poorly on the first exam. And you notice that if you look at the blue bar, that's how they performed on the final exam. And you notice that the performance on the final exam is 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 comparable to the students who didn't enter, who, 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 who did well on the first exam and opted not to be mentored. I think another important uh, uh, gain is to look at the green bar and that's really measured as the delta, the change between in performance between the first exam and the rest of the, the course performance. And you can see that the group that, that was mentored had the highest uh, uh, overall improvement. And then the green, gray and black boxes uh, measure uh, effort. And you say, well, effort, how do you measure effort? Well, effort is very much connected to motivation uh, to do well in the class. And one metric for that, and this was more comprehensive than, than, than that metric, but one metric, for example, would be how much effort uh, students put into problem sets. You know, do they actually put in, do the weekly assignments? Do they turn them in? What's the quality of the work that they do? And so that was a, a measure of, of effort. So uh, the program overall was seen as, as, a, as a success. 14% of the, the students signed up for the mentoring program, 11% actively participated. Uh, and compared with the peers that didn't participate, mentees showed substantial learning gains. That was that, that green bar I showed you earlier. Uh, among the, the group that performed the weakest before spring break, so in the first half of the course, course failures were eliminated for students who participated in mentoring, but not for those who didn't. So remember, there was a group of students who did poorly, but who chose not to, to enter the mentoring program. And those students had a much higher fail rate than the students who entered the mentoring program. Uh, Mentees also showed evidence of increased effort. I showed you this. This is this is the as measured by by you know things like weekly uh, uh, assignments. And then finally, there was a whole set of of surveys, and I'll share a little bit with you that showed that participants were very enthusiastic about the program, uh, and really also expressed a strong desire for it to expand uh, to other subjects, not just to to electricity and magnetism. So some comments from from mentees so it's very clear that the mentees really valued and uh, the program and benefited uh, from the program so uh, you know here's a comment uh, at the very top as a result of the program my grade in 802 increased but more importantly my understanding and interest in physics grew significantly this program became one of my favorite parts of my academic experience at M mit uh, now i'll just remind you that this this class with you know with 800 students is students who are not who are most of them are not going to be future physics majors these are students who are studying other subjects at MIT uh, you know for their degrees um, another comment it was amazingly helpful it got me through tough times including academic and non-academic and it made me feel a lot more confident in my chances of succeeding uh, Another comment, this program has helped me a lot with understanding of the material and with solving problem set problems. It also gives me reassurance that when I do not understand something, I can ask and discuss slowly 
with someone I trust. So look at all the elements that are here. Trust, that was one of the goals of, of, of a good mentoring relationship. Uh, uh, understanding and, 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 and interest in physics, that was one of the goals. Uh, getting through tough times, including non-academic issues. Uh, again, something where, that you know, we were really uh, striving for. And, and then um, another remarkable comment was that talking to someone with more experience and establishing a one-on-one -on -one relationship gives my life some stability in times of chaos. So this was also the right thing for the pandemic. And, and finally, uh, please make this an institute-wide practice. This was amazing for me. I cannot emphasize enough. Honestly, one of the only things that got me through MIT going online. So I chose this program to share with you because of comments like this, because I think there is an opportunity for institutions worldwide to think about this kind of, of, of mentoring program. And I'll say a bit more about how it works in case anyone wants to uh, implement it. Now, it turns out mentors also really valued and benefited from the program. It wasn't just something very positive for the, uh, for the, for the, the mentees. And this is a, a long first quote, but what it really boils down to was that, that the relationship initially started uh, a little bit tentatively, but as the mentor got to know their mentee, it became a, a, a very productive relationship and where the, the mentor felt that even after this program, I could still talk to them. So they, they have created a, a lifelong relationship. Um, another comment was for our undergraduate mentors, one of the things that they really appreciated was they were on equal footing with the faculty and staff. So the mentors were not just faculty and staff, but also students. And the students felt like they were doing something that was as important and meaningful uh, as the, their faculty. And this really boosts their confidence and their own self-efficacy as well. So this is really a two-way thing. And then uh, finally, the, the mentors themselves were part of a support structure that I'll talk about. And that support system, uh, so here a mentor says, the, uh, it was only the support system I truly felt like was there for me in remote learning and was a community I knew I would seek every week uh, and that we would work together on something we cared about and support one another. So the mentors in turn were also supported in, by Ed and his staff. And so there was this, this sort of pyramid of support, if you will. So <clears throat> the program has been expanded and, and in the fall of 2020, it was, it was uh, expanded to cover a number of, of, of classes in physics as here's a long list of them, but these are, you can th think of it as, it covers all of first and second year uh, physics classes for, for, for physics students. Uh, and uh, the, the goal of this expanded program was to build mentor-mentee relationships as a means to connect mentees with both institutional resources and building community within the department, because now the second year classes are, are students who are going to be physics majors. And then another very important part was to establish what's called a a community of practice. And this is where the mentors are partners in the academic mission of the department. And that's what I, I, I showed you on my previous slide about, about mentors feeling on equal footing with faculty and feeling like they were doing important, meaningful work uh, alongside the faculty. And this has been launched as a pilot program with the, the hope or intent that the final program will be become a sustainable facet of the physics department. You know, this is only at the, you know, the, the semester where it was offered just uh, ended uh, end of last, uh, late last year. And so we are, you know, there's a lot of data to look at, et cetera, but that was, that's the sort of the, the, the hope or intent. So what was the structure of the program? The structure of the program was that it's course-based mentoring. This is an important, point that I've, I've uh, hit upon before. So it really is targeting, providing sort of content-based support in a specific subject. Uh, the program uh, is, you know, the mentors will assist mentees with the course material, the problem sets, et cetera. A very important thing, which is not possible at, at many institutions, but uh, you know, MIT has the resources to do this. The mentors were paid positions and and this is, of course, you know, there are pros and 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 cons to the the whole structure. Uh, there was, you know, the pros are that the men, the mentees, uh, the mentors received a lot of their, their own training on how to support their mentees, and that was 
done through structured conversations and and it was uh, you know since these were paid positions it established a real value to to doing this work and and the, the cons were that that you know because of budgetary cons constraints there's more limited recruitment of mentors so you, you know every every place that tries to do this has to come up with their own balance of of how to do this but that's how we did it in the physics department now the responsibilities of mentors were they actually went to two to two three hours of training uh in the week before classes started and then they each are uh, 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 are assigned two or about two mentees to support or sometimes a little bit more sometimes a little bit less and they commit to about four hours per week. And those four hours are to spend one hour per week with each of their two mentees, one hour of prep, because remember there's also content to learn, they have to know the physics as well. And one hour of the weekly community of practice meeting where all the issues were discussed and Ed and Shirsten would provide training to the mentors. Um, and then uh, and then the, uh, you know, so the weekly community of practice meetings con consisted of, the, of a check-in, and a conversation and support and professional de development for the mentors. So I, I, I want to sort of emphasize that this has been, you know, this is a, an area of best practice that I hope many other uh, 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 departments and, and universities can adopt. Now, I will also, uh, I'm gonna ch change gears a bit and speak about the second um, uh, case study, which I will go through much more quickly because <clears throat> I don't have that much uh, data on, uh, uh, on it, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll speak to, to, to that. And that was the undergraduate research uh, uh, program. And, and this pro program is something that um, uh, Kathy Modica, who is the, who is the, uh, the academic uh, administrator in the physics department, and, and I, when I was associate head of the department, uh, had to and very quickly uh, with the start of the pandemic rollout. So what were the, the, the what is this program before the pandemic? Before the pandemic, <clears throat> the way that this UROP program worked was it was a very ad hoc process where students would approach faculty, uh, you know, a, a principal investigators, so faculty PIs, you know, seeking UROP positions. I would like to do some research in your group. And it was a somewhat ad hoc a process where students would not necessarily connect with faculty, the faculty were busy, they wouldn't always respond, and it was a very <clears throat> difficult process for students who were, you know, who often had to try, try to connect with many different faculty before they found a, a, a position. Um, there were two primary sources of funding. There was something called direct Europe funding, which is a centralized Europe office that, uh, that, that funded some fraction of, of research that students did in, in faculty groups, and then the faculty's own research funds, whether it was your, your grants or your own research money would fund students as well. So these were primarily paid positions, paid in these two ways. You can also do Europe for credit or, or, or as a volunteer, but primarily people are paid, students are paid, and they, they work on the research in faculty groups in this way. Now, when the pandemic struck, suddenly there were some other uh, very significant forces that came into play. Many students lost their other employment. So pandemic struck in, uh, in, in the US and, and at MIT in, in March, and many students were slated to go to research internships and to work in companies. And this is how they make money over the summer to pay for part of their education in the fall. And so many students lost employment. There were also very reduced opportunities for students to actually interact with faculty in looking for these Europe's, you know, where they, you know, where they often would go up after class and talk to a faculty member or talk to their advisors. Um, many labs shut down, so the number of, of, of research opportunities also shrank dramatically. Uh, but there was also some other positives, and one of the positives for, for labs in particular was that there was also cost savings had occurred where you know, there was reduced spending on consumables if you're running a lab and you don't need to keep the lab going with the things that you, you use, reagents, chemicals, et cetera. Um, there were some reductions in costs and of course no one was traveling. So we saw an opportunity here to, to, to take some of those, those resources that had been saved through, through, through this process and channel them towards uh, the students who had lost employment. So we launched a Europe matching program where we asked faculty PIs and their group members to provide 
project descriptions and desired qualifications for students. Now, what kind of student do you want? Do they need to know programming? Do they need to know how to use a machine shop, uh, et cetera? And then we posted these project uh, 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 descriptions on a centralized website that students could access. The students then submitted to, to Kathy and me, uh, 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 it, you know, their top rank order choices for the projects they wished to work on. And then we had this triaging process where we had other databases from which we also knew who were the students with the greatest financial need, uh, both self-reported and from these other databases. And we, and we identified and prioritized the students that, that needed, you know, most needed the funding. And then we literally manually uh, matched students and faculty uh, with projects, taking these criteria into account that they had to be an intellectual uh, uh, match as well as trying to prioritize financial uh, need. And then the way that we paid for this was that the demand for summer Europe this, this past summer was up something like threefold across MIT due to the loss of other employment opportunities for students. And so the faculty PIs provided a, a, a significantly more funding than in a typical summer. And this is, you know, this is something that the faculty really stepped up for, uh, both in terms of funding and the number of positions, because we had to suddenly make room to, 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 for students to do Europe's at MIT, where a very large number of students actually is not on at, at MIT in the summer. And they're off on, on you know, in other parts of, on, uh, you know, doing other kinds of, uh, of summer work. Uh, and then the, the Europe office, the dean and the department also provided the uh, substantial increases in funding so that we could, we could handle, uh, you know, uh, this large increase. Uh, so I would say this is another program that that turned out to be a success and is, is, a, is, is, a, is a real keeper. So we have had uh, very positive feedback, both from the students and faculty. And it was, it's very interesting. The faculty really had to stretch to do this, but we also got very positive feedback from the faculty because they had this, they did not have to interview, you know, a half dozen students before figuring out which was the best match to, to their group. We did that for them by doing this intake from students and intake from faculty. We asked the our faculty, what kind of student do you need? We asked the students to, to provide us with their own CVs and background. And then we, we did some of the matching. And so this is also now being pr proposed to develop into a permanent program that the department will continue to support. So those are sort of the two case studies that I wanted to, to share with you. And now I'm going to sort of broaden out and branch out into, into, into some wider thoughts. And then I'd like to really open up to, to discussion, which I hope we can have. So what do we think about, how can we think about higher education beyond the current pandemic? Or some might argue between pandemics if this is, this is the, the way of the, the future. So there are a number of issues that one must think about you know in in providing equitable education during the pandemic what kind of grading policies should one have can you really hold students who are in all different kinds of circumstances and 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 difficulties to maintain you know a high high, high level of performance how do students take exams how are they proctored how do you make sure there's not not cheating um admissions requirements how do you you know, if students can't can't make it to to taking standardized tests, how do you? What requirements do you put in for admissions in the following year? And then, of course, I've been I've focused my my case studies on undergraduates, but there's also graduate students, and they have face a a a, a, a different set of of issues, including you know significant delays in in getting their dissertations done because the labs were shut down. You know, if you're in 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 science and and, and, and technology fields, or, you know, but if you, even if you're in the humanities, you don't have access to, to libraries, to archives, all kinds of things have, have slowed down the, the research enterprise. And then again, as my presentation right now has been very student focused as it should be for the gospel education is about students, but the faculty and staff have also faced incredible uh, new challenges in providing uh, you know, quality education during the pandemic. So I also want to recognize that. And these are some topics we can come back to in, in, in discussion. So let me just 
talk about what might happen, you know, in, in the post pandemic. So here are three possible post pandemic models, which I actually uh, uh, read in, in an article by by Jeff Salingo. So these are not my ideas, but I thought these were good ways to 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 think about about you know what might the post pandemic world in high, higher education look like. And so the the idea is that you know it certainly is true that the pandemic will subside and large numbers of students will return to physical campuses. But it's also very likely that there will be a new normal in higher education, which is likely to be a mix of online and in-person uh, education. And, and so what might those models look like? So there's the immersive hybrid models where colleges determine which experiences are best served in a physical space and which of those are better delivered uh, digitally. So you could imagine a space in which taking classes is much, much better done online, especially if they're pre-recorded uh, lectures, but that then you meet with faculty members in, in person for having discussions. So that would be one possible model. The other thing that's I think become very clear, and this is very related to the the, the social equity question is that higher ed is going to need to have flexible pathways. And what that means is there has to be many different ways to achieving a, a college degree. Uh, you know, in, in the US in particular, there are tiers of education where you have, have community colleges or two-year colleges that offer certificates. And, and, and then you have these residential colleges where students live on campus for four years. And something in between is probably also likely to, to have to evolve where you might have a low residency options where students spend less time on campus have also spent some time away from campus working on on internships externships research projects outside of campus and a third model that might might evolve is what's called the continual learning model which is not that you go to university for four years you you get your degree in some chosen field and then you go out and you work for the rest of your life but rather that you have some continuing kind of degree where where the higher education is is a platform for lifelong learning where you know learners they move in and out of a curriculum throughout their lives to gain you know knowledge and skills uh, as they need so these are some of the 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 models that that may that may emerge and there are many others these are just the, the three that i took from jeff's uh, the Salingo uh, uh, articles um, but I think one thing that we must think about is that if hybrid models are, are part of our, our, our future, then we are really going to face the question of equity uh, in that model very strongly. Uh, you know, we see already today with you know, online learning, the students with private places to study, with reliable Wi-Fi and, and, and lower economic stresses in their home, environments are doing better in, 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 you know, uh, uh, in academic performance. And, and if, if the future of higher ed is going to include something where, where you know, people spend less time on, on, on campus, then we're going to have to figure out how you know, colleges will extend these residential-based resources to students uh, that rely on them for their success. And that's a very interesting uh, point to be made here that I, I, I should make. So, you know, we think about residential colleges and universities as a very elite setting, and they are, let's not, let's not, you know, uh, make any mistake about that. But they also have the function of equalizing uh, uh, as well. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So, if you're a student from uh, from uh, a, a, a lower socioeconomic background than another student, once you arrive on that campus, those differences become fewer. You live in the same dorms. You log onto the same Wi-Fi. You go to the same classes. You're taught by the same professors. So, in you know, the residential environment has some ability to equalize. Uh, that is simply not possible once students are all studying in in their in their individual home environments. And so, that's going to be some. We have to think about how to. To, to equalize that. And this is an idea that, that was written up in, in, in Inside Higher Ed uh, uh, by Maloney and, and Tim in, in May 2020. All right, 
So uh, this is my, 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 my closing uh, remarks, which is a post-pandemic future must address um, in the higher ed space, affordability and sustainability. How can people afford uh, education that's, that's you know, growing uh, more and more expensive, much more quickly than, than, than people's own incomes are? Uh, we have to address the questions of, of you know, elitism in the in in the uh, education sphere, you know, and the many tiers of of, of universities that that we have in many countries, the U.S. certainly in, included. Uh, I don't think any future in in on campus will be possible without really confronting questions of diversity, equity, inclusion, and and justice. And so those are sort of the sort of the 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 social uh, aspects of thinking about a post-pandemic future for higher ed. And then there's also the financial aspect of it, which is you know, having more value-based models. You know, really in the end, as higher ed is, is, get, is, is getting more and more expensive, we have to ask ourselves the same questions that students and their families are asking, which is when I pay all this money, what am I getting for it? And so what's the value and what kinds of value do education add. And then another part of the economic equation has to be, you know, research is, you know, increasingly an important part of higher education. It's embedded in it uh, uh, more and more. And how do you fund research? Because research is an inherently really expensive uh, undertaking, and there are no good models for how to fund it. Uh, that that are that that exist looking out into the future. Uh, so I am going to stop here uh, and I know, thank you for listening and I'm going to stop my screen share and then I'd love to uh, to uh, uh, entertain any questions with the caveat that many of these things that I've, I've spoken about as you've seen are our work of colleagues and so uh, you know I don't have answers to everything but I'm, I'm happy to take questions and answer whatever I can. Thank you so much, Nargis, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for further discussion. Uh, but first, Professor Berker, uh, I give the ground to him. Uh, Nargis, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And this shows once more that the most important thing at the university are the students. Uh, that's why we exist and that's why we continue to excel and that uh, in fact uh, the quality of this uh, bringing up students well is not just to bring them up to do the jobs in society but to sustain oneself as a top university and MIT yeah. arguably is one of the best universities from many aspects and the reason for that is that it is so centered so you can you can only be a great university if you're a great educational institution, that's chosen. By the way, I myself in 1969 was in the group of first Europe students and had many Europe uh, students myself. But my question here is, uh, in, this new, uh, uh, in this new environment, I hate to say everybody has used the new normal, which has become a cliche, but in this new environment, I sense a danger. And that is that uh, you can always improve courses and adapt courses, and suddenly to overvalue courses as opposed to individual research. Uh, and, and undergraduate education, as MIT taught me, in which you don't do research from day number one is in our day worthless. So, but here we can really adapt courses to this environment, but not individual research. And there, there's also the human factor, the mentor, mentor problem, that in fact, it, it's a lonely thing to do research for the first time. Uh, for the second time oh, as a student. So those uh, uh, the students also need mentors to go on with research. And it's a two-way process. It's just like a human personal relationship. There's no the right and wrong. If a research project doesn't go well with a student, the faculty and the student need to adapt. So uh, have you thought about doing having a mentoring problem for undergraduates doing research and for faculty who are uh, monitoring research and maybe not having such a great great time progressing. I think that's going to be a real need. Yeah, so I think this is 
really, really important and really, uh, you know, good points you bring up. So, uh, you know, research is more of the apprenticeship model than any other part of our education, because many of the things that we do in research is not yet written up in textbooks. The results of our research will be the topics of textbooks, you know, if we're lucky a decade uh, later, right? So uh, how do you teach that? And so I think the only way to do that is indeed through through mentorship uh, 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 programs. But I think the Europe, uh, it, what we did certainly when we had this large expansion of the Europe program, we set out a set of guidelines for how to interact with, because remember all Europe's were online. There was no one going to their labs. In fact, when the Europe program began in the summer, MIT labs were all still shut, it was shut down. So uh, so there was a, a, there is a silver lining uh, and I can even speak from my, my, my own uh, experience. I'm usually much more hands off with my Europe's because my students, my graduate students and postdocs work with them. Um, but, you know, we had weekly meetings with, you know, one on one and together uh, and group meetings. So you really had to stretch to make those connections. Uh, but some, you know, some students will argue that they had more contact with their Europe supervisors than they have in the past because it was online. And so people were more thoughtful about it. Like me, normally when I have a student, I'm just like, oh, if I run into them in the lab, that's great. And, and but there was no lab to run into them. Everything they did was deliberate. And there was, you know, and so uh, every interaction was deliberate. So I think that is important what you said. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we issued guidelines. We didn't have an actual mentoring program. We issued guidelines. And what did the guidelines say? They said all the obvious things. Meet with your students at least once a week, one-on-one, -on -one, and, and as a group, you know, just the, the usual set of things. And um, so, but I think when, it, when you think about these hybrid models, the one place where I, I think hybridization or, or online is not possible is in the research sphere. For the reasons I said, the textbooks haven't been written. Thank you so much. Um, Sondan Hocam. Yeah. Uh, Nagis, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I have a question and a comment also. Let me first uh, ask the question. You know, the mentoring program, MIT designed during the pandemic, and when you see the, the list of the needs of the student may have, okay? Mm -hmm. Actually, they are the same needs even if they have the face-to-face uh, um, uh, -face, uh, education. Then the next question, if you think that there is really exceptional result in implementing this program, is there any plan at MIT to implement the program after the students have their life back? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, Sanan, yes. So I, I think you're absolutely right. And in fact, one of the things that that you know, Ed, Ed Birchinger, who sort of you know really has championed this program, would say is, you know, yes, these needs were not new. We knew we needed such a mentoring program, and the pandemic just heightened that or amplified that. And so our plan is certainly to maintain this mentoring program uh, uh, after the, the the pandemic, and and in, in part because. Uh, you know, if you think about the 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 online aspect of learning, uh, those issues, you know, you know, students with different stressors, it occurs even in the residential setting. It's not just because they're home; it's it's harder because they're home and in, in difficult environments. But it's also hard. so. Yes, there's a plan to. I I've also seen a number of other. Uh, 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 departments at MIT looking at this program so uh, as as a um, um, as a as a beacon so I'm very optimistic that it will expand and it'll be good for students okay so from the comment I have you know uh, in your presentation uh, you talk about the possible models after the pandemic and actually, at Cadillac University, we are already implementing completely different model in higher education. Mm -hmm. In our model has two legs. One is the first year 
in this year, the goal of this program is to, to convert, transform the student into a world citizen. So even if, if they, are an, they are going to be in engineering, there is no math science courses in their first year because we have to make sure that they are a universal person. The second mm -hmm. and third and the fourth year, we change the way the, they learn. There is no standard or conventional lecturing. They, the students, will have their projects pools and they will pick up all the research pools. They just pick up these projects and they are going to learn by doing, instead of, you know, I am teaching them or Nagis is teaching them, they will learn by doing. So we have mm -hmm. our own model. We also did it, and we did it before the panel. Fantastic! That's great. Thank you're you. you're 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 ahead of the times. <laughs> yes, we are actually. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much again. And now um, we can take questions. You can write in the chat, or if you would like to pose your questions yourself, um, you can turn on your cameras and microphones. We're also live on YouTube. If there are any questions from our viewers at YouTube, you can type it on the chat and I will um, read them for Professor Nargis. And yes, I have I, another question. I Nargis, I have another question. Mm -hmm. Actually, usually when you look at it, I always we focus on the, on the needs of the student, but also there is another uh, issue is the need of faculty member during pandemic. And yeah. did you have any special program for helping out the faculty uh, during the pandemic? Yes, there was a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of things and a lot of discussion and a lot of things. And I think the I think one of the most important ones, and this was true for faculty and, and also uh, staff, was that all the, the schools were shut down. So people were doing their, you know, full-time teaching and, and faculty jobs whilst also having their children at home. Uh, and so fa certainly faculty with young kids, little children was really, really uh, difficult and for staff. So there were a number of financial programs to help with that. But you know, that only helps so far when in the middle of a pandemic, you're not gonna have a, a, a caregiver come to your home yeah. to take care of your kids. And so it was, it's very complicated. And I, I think it's been really hard for a, a number of people, people are exhausted, and uh, and you know, so uh, you 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 you're right on. Okay, thank you, Marius. I I saw one one we, question. We have a question. Yeah. yeah, someone raised the hand. Ali Jan Sarai, um, Ali Jan, um, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, like before I ask my question, I want to thank you for two things. Um, the first one is this talk. I'm a second year physics undergraduate, and I wish I had these types of programs in my university. And like they were definitely what we need. And the second one is LIGO. Like uh, it was one of the first experiments I had read outside of my classes. And like it motivated me to be a physicist. And now I'm talking to you like face to face and uh, it was a it was a like a special moment for me and Thank you. and like for a like a future like a, a academic person like I, i'm thinking about like having a doctorate of like uh, physics and like i want to ask how does mit's graduate admission committee looks at candidates who had struggled uh, in their classes at the pandemic times like I know. Yeah. Know. Yeah. So that's a really good uh, question, Ali So, uh, what we have done in physics, and I think uh, many departments have done, is 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 a few things. So we fully understand uh, that, you know, many many universities uh, decided not to uh, uh, award grades during during the pandemic, or or that students' grades will be affected by by you know the circumstances they find themselves in during the pandemic so we've done a couple of things the first is we have actually uh decided not to accept um uh standardized test scores we're not we're not you're not even you know we're not even, we're not even asking for them it's not optional you're just we don't want to know because if you know if half the students 
you know, the, if the privileged students manage to take the test, do well, and they give us their scores, it, as humans, we would find it hard to ignore. So we have taken that away completely. Um, and, and then there is much more thought given to looking at a student's academic record before the pandemic. So in, in particular to say that we, you know, either they have no grades because the school didn't, you know, university didn't provide grades or that their grades will be affected in any case by, by this. So we're trying just to, again, to not pay, place much weight um, uh, on that. So that's sort of, I think the two uh, big things. There's a lot of uncertainty right now in what you know, admissions and especially graduate admissions is going to look like because some of, the, you know, some schools have already announced that they're simply not going to take in a new entering graduate student class. And so I, I believe Columbia, for example. So at MIT, we're not doing that at all. But what that means is that we're going to have a large number of applicants who are applying to us who don't have an option to go to one of the other peer schools. So it's, there's uncertainty, but I think, I think, you know, uh, I would just encourage you to, uh, to, to, I would encourage you to apply to wherever you think you want to go, because I think all admissions committees are very aware of the disruptions uh, of the pandemic. Thank you so much. There is another question from Cleva Ouyang. Um, could you turn on your mic, please? Wait. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. So, uh, Nargis, thank you very much for raising all of these uh, issues and, and starting getting this conversation going more broadly. Um, I really appreciate your, your presentation and it'd be great to hear about your physics accomplishments uh, and another opportunity. <laughs> But my question Thank you. for you is, you know, how many, okay, you guys talked about expanding this program to more courses. So all of the freshman, sophomore year courses, which, how many TAs did you, were you able to uh, recruit undergraduate TAs or mentees? So that's the first question. And the second question is um, the physics program is, or physics department is one of the smaller, more manageable sized programs at MIT. Like, how can this be adopted for some of the huge programs, like Core 6? Yeah, so these are, 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 are good questions. It turns out physics is, is, is among the biggest departments at, at MIT. Nothing like Core 6, but it is, is in the top five. So, uh, so it is actually, uh, and then I, I, the other thing that you want to, you know, keep in mind is that the pilot was done with 802, which is a 800 student class. Yeah. So, so in some sense, I, I think that in itself, to me, and not, you know, not having thought about it very deeply, as you as you have asked, mm -hmm. um, it, it seems like the scalability is already there, given that it started with an 800 student class. Okay. So, uh, but it, it is a challenge. And I'll tell you that the, the biggest challenge in, in course-based mentoring is you need to find enough mentors who are expert in the subject matter, you know, and or, or will spend the time to gain that expertise. So that is a continuous challenge, but it's also, it's also one of the things that students who sign up to be mentors have really liked, which is the opportunity to engage with the course material, to learn it better, without the pressure of being the TA who has to stand up in front of the whole class, you know, you can kind of learn along with your mentee and, and, you know, there's, it's sort of more interactive. So I think there's some advantages there, but you ask a good, a good question. And, and, and I don't have a crisp answer other than, uh, other than the sort of this vague idea that, that because it was 802, the scalability is, 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 is apparent. Thank you. Nihal, thank you. you try to? Thank you so much. Um, Professor Shener Oktik uh, is with us raising his hand. Professor, could you turn on your mic? Yes. Professor Mavalvala, thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation. And uh, I, I can see, uh, as everybody has, you have got some uh, uh, worries on the efficiency of what we do. Uh, 
and trying to improve it. And the mentors and mentees relationships are important, but while you are extending this uh, mentorship program, is it, do you develop any assessment techniques to really assess the mentors? Because mentoring has many facets. So each person do not have the same successful abilities on those facets. How you can really measure the success of a mentor? Did you develop any program to really assess the mentors? Thank you. So that's a, a, that's a really good question. And I know that this is something that, that Ed Birchinger has, has thought a lot about and he's also written about. And I wish I knew the answer. I, I know he does. I just don't uh, know the answer. But uh, certainly one of the, the, you know, the, these, you know, there's, there's quantitative metrics but there's also just the, the whole, the qualitative feedback that you get from the mentors. And I showed you some of the qualitative feedback of the degree of engagement that the mentors uh, have had with the program. And so I do, I mean, he, he is certainly looking at both uh, uh, of those. I can't tell you what they are. And I, I would highly encourage if you, if you want to really hear from the expert to have Ed, you know, come give a talk on his program, because he has taught a lot about this and many other issues of, of equity. In fact, I would I would be safe to say most of what I, I know on this, I have learned from him. So. Thank you so much. Um, so I know we're running out of time. These are the last couple of minutes we have. Uh, it's been such a wonderful presentation and there are so many questions still coming in and uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought actually or after we're thinking about these issues. Um, Sondana Jam, would you like to say the last words? Your mic is off. Uh, Nagis, uh, uh, thanks again for being part of this uh, colloquium series. And I think before we close, Nihat Ojam also raise a hand. Probably if he wants to say a few things or ask the questions, let, let him do that. And I appreciate your contribution. Thank you. And hopefully, when we have our life back, and yes. we will host you at Kadir Has University. And I want you to meet with our undergraduate and graduate students too. Thank you, Nagis. Thank you very much for, for, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for, for, for joining us here. Yeah. If, I, if I may add a few short comments, I was inspired by Ali Jan's comment, who was my student, Ali Jan himself. But uh, I should add that Kriva Oyang is a previous co a colleague of Sondan Hoja and myself from our previous stop and also an MIT person. You obviously realized that when she said course six, she could have also said, you don't give class anymore in 26100, right? So she is one of us. Uh, and also we did host, uh, uh, we did host uh, Ed Bershinger here uh, previously as part of our MIT Turkey uh, uh, freshman scholarship program. This was, uh, Ed came with his son actually, uh, which, were, which was very good. And Nergis also talked talk with our students. She comes all the time. But this, is, this, this, this may go on the list of connections. One thing I was gonna say is that in this, in, in, a positive side on this, at least for theorists, nowadays you can accept graduate students as a theorist, and you don't have to bring them in on campus. You don't have to bring them to the country. You can do theoretical okay, research sure. with all over the world. And I think that would be, a, experiment is something else, but I think that would be a courageous thing for MIT to start mm -hmm. for a theoretical group to take students on uh, without dealing with visas, who's gonna come in, who's gonna go out and just do research on a global network doctorate research. That would be a great thing. And I think MIT has the courage and the vision and the know-how to do this. I, I, I think that, that, that that's uh, certainly true. Uh, let, let me add a small uh, caveat to this, which is something we're dealing with even, even now. It turn, turns out that even though MIT uh, could be visionary in this in this uh, space. Uh, the U.S. government is not so so visionary, <laughs> and there are many many uh, sort of tax and other 
silly things that you have to sort out before you can do exactly what you're proposing. And the reason we know this the hard way is that, of course, we, we are doing that right now, and it's, it's proving to be, you know, complex. So I'll, I'll just say that it's, it's a lovely idea, and, I, I, and, and there, are, there are kinks to work out. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nergis Mamalbala, for joining us at our public uh, online colloquium at Kadiras University. Thanks everyone for joining us for this wonderful uh, presentation today. Um, we will be sharing uh, the video on our YouTube channel afterwards, and we will hopefully meet at our next colloquium. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye, Nergis. Bye-bye.